Good evening. It is June 13, 1227 AM, our normal time. Welcome all data analysts, scientists, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, and friends alike. Welcome and gratitude. All right, what we have here first we're looking at is the VAERS reporting system from the CDC has been reestablished. So this is our data as follows. Now keep in mind, two weeks ago, this number right here was about 217,000. In 14 days, we've increased close to about 100,000 vaccine adverse event reports. Fact checkers, you're going to have a lot of work ahead of you tonight because we got a lot of facts to check. So to begin with, our data here is as follows. Year 2020, the full year, we had 57,115 adverse event reports in reference to vaccines. 2021. 314,496. It is now June 13th. And this is from January 1st, 2021 to, I think, June 12th. Actually, no, let's take that back. I think June 8th, uh, basically 2021. And we'll watch the rise next week. Should we be concerned about such a dramatic rise in basically vaccine adverse event reports? Is there a psychological aspect to it? Uh, some have to validate it as follows, but keep in mind, traditionally, only 1% of reports get, re I mean, adverse events become, or should say, are reported to the VARA system, 1% normally. Now, however, though, this can be an exception this year, so keep that in mind. And as follows for the fact checkers, the data we're going to be utilizing here comes from as follows. The Vaccine Adverse Event Report Data Set System from our hhs.gov. And if you with us right here, we're looking at 2020, the size of our database was 41.24 megabytes. 2021, we are at 209.89 megabytes. Again, to reiterate the question, should that be disconcerting or not? I am just here to look at the data not incorporate publisher bias. Personally, I have my own opinion, of course, but that's the size of our database compared to that. Now keep in mind, uh, some people have a lot of symptoms beyond five, and therefore they take up more than a few reports. So I try to eliminate those duplications, so to say. All right, the stories I'm going to be covering are as follows. Well, let me go back real fast. Uh, those short on time, as I promised, this is the uh, results in the reference to children, my reference to children, individuals under the age of, or I should say 18 or younger. All right, this is their word cloud. And if those are not familiar with word cloud, the larger the word, the bigger the word, the dominance of the word in the cloud, the more likely you could see some of the things we'll be covering tonight, uh, the adverse event report. And I'm going to back this up just a little bit so it's a little easier to get in. There's that. And there's a word cloud. Hopefully, we can fit there. Yeah, it's close enough. So if you look at the size of the words, for example, you could basically um, deduce from here that fatigue and headache would be your primary, uh, basically, symptoms reported to the VAERS report, followed by chest pain, chest discomfort, headaches, uh, pain, abdominal pain, so on and so forth, uh, which is real interesting because the adverse events in children that get reported, uh, I want to keep on emphasizing that they get reported, not necessarily validated, but get reported, uh, are different than those which are seen in adults. So just something to keep in mind as we proceed. All right, the stories we'll be covering tonight as follows. All right, we will be looking at this. LSU Health New Orleans study reports compound block SARS-CoV-2 protects lungs. Uh, malicious spots supposedly are spreading misinformation. The reason I wanted to bring this one up is because they somehow included the Danmas 19 study, and I want to add some clarity to that. All right, after that, uh, one of the pri primary pioneers of mRNA technology, fact checkers, this is what we're doing. We're covering the story of a story we are not elucidating or attempting to draw a hypothesis based upon the story in a conclusion. To proceed, mRNA technology pioneers says COVID-19 vaccinated people can shed spike protein, so Twitter says delete this. We are covering the fact that Twitter deleted it, 
and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Pfizer vaccine. Now, this is an interesting one, too. Uh, the way they manufactured the viruses in order to utilize the test, I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to let you uh, come to your own conclusion. Uh, is how they basically created chimeric viruses utilizing HIV mixing with the spikes pro spike, spice protein, spike protein. All right. Just a side note, children can understand sadness and happiness when people wearing face masks. That's going to be a real brief one. And, of course, this one, just by reading it, we pretty much covered it. Uh, the new event called Doom Scrolling, a reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. All right. As we proceed as follows. Also, too, we are going to be adding a new section to the data analytics uh, from my very, very amateur standpoint. Red Queen is what we'll call it, for those familiar with that. All right. What we're looking at here is variants and for the data analyst and as well as the fact checkers what we're utilizing here is the data from and this is really a very cool site i, I recommend anybody that that is into uh, formulating policy or basically looking at projections this is a really cool site this is outbreak.info and it basically covers all the variants in the mutations so on and so forth uh tracks the lineage and this is the data which we're going to be scraping from or drawing from just as a heads up all right let's get right into the research as follows this is actually kind of cool this is uses something called basically uh levonoids. and what they discovered was this research conducted at lsu health new orleans please forgive me i'm going to slow down my reading just a little bit i'll speed up a little bit later on as we try to get uh, more condensed in our time constraints uh, LSE New Orleans Neuroscience Center for Excellence reports that elevenoids, bioactive chemical messengers made from omega-3 very long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids discovered by the Bezian Lab in 2017, may block the virus that causes COVID-19 from entering cells and protect the air cells of the lung. Their findings are published in the scientific reports available here. Now keep in mind, I'll have the link on the YouTube channel, uh, but this is actually really cool. Uh, the research team tested levonoids on infected lung tissue. Now, this is now this is just going into basically, you know, a small case study uh, from a 78-year-old man in petri dish cultures. Obviously, the 78-year-old man was not in the petri dish, but you understand where where they uh, uh, extracted the lung tissue. They found that the ELV, ELVs, elevenoids, not only reduced the ability of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to bind to receptors and enter cells, but they also triggered the production of protective anti-inflammatory proteins that counteract lung damage. That is pretty neat. That is another one where they come up with uh, generally the, the oils, for example, from omega-3 and so on and so forth, that may yield uh, some sort of protective effect, uh, at least if not from an epidemiological aspect, uh, reference to observing diets, but still it is really quite intriguing all right then too after that now i'll have the links there too but this is just something just in the back of your head for protection or if you know anybody or whatever it is in the medical field it's not a bad thing to reference for future exploration number two malicious bots are the primary pathogen of covid19 misinformation on social media all due respect this is published in the journal Amer american medical association of internal medicine all right I love this article in reference to the fact is that basically bots are projecting information. And we noticed that during election. In fact, half the communication I think during in the last, I know at least during the, uh, the Clinton and Trump election was bots actually arguing with bots. So bots project a lot. And the problem is a lot of people try to alter their social behavior, ironically based upon being botted. But to proceed as follows. Among the Facebook groups least most influenced by bots, the team monitored posts that shared the link to the Danish study to assess face masks for the protection against COVID-19 infection called DanMask19, a randomized clinical trial in the Annals of Internal Medicine. We selected DanMask for our study because masks are an important public health measure to potentially control the pandemic and are a source of popular debate. All right, again, this is a primary article reference to botting. And, but however though, the problem is you can see the collateral damage. The collateral damage here is the devaluation of the information in reference to the Dan Mass study. Also, too, if you notice here as well, 
in an attempt to communicate, now remember, editing and things like that can get involved. So I'm not going to fault the researchers if someone else edited this and took it out of context. So keep that in mind, all right? Everyone, you know, you, without knowing individuals, no way to make actual a, a, a rational uh, observation. But in this one line here, it can be very, very deceiving. Because the primary reason is, as we covered back in, what was it? Doo -doo -doo -doo, November 22nd, 2020, when the Dan Mass study was originally uh, broke, it said, quote, a recommendation to wear a surgical mask when outside the home, this is the Dan Mass study, for those not familiar, did not reduce at convention level statistical significance, incident SARS-CoV-2 infection compared with no mask recommendation at all. Now, keep in mind, this is actually a real study, a real study. But you can see how it becomes collateral damage in the war on fake news because it's not fake. But however, though, it was used as a hook because some individuals added what was called publisher bias, adding greater dimensions to the research uh, than, than they should have, even though this appears to be one case, one post, is really utilizing an outlier in order to uh, make a general observation, which is probably not an appropriate method. Again, not knowing who edited the article. Um, yeah, there's, it could be very deceiving. So the article is this, and I want to reiterate what it came down to once again, because now that it's basically being um, elucidated in reference to uh, fake news, it looks like they may have done a little bit update in there as March 2021. So let's go back down here. So when look at basically what they came up with, although the difference observed was not statistically significant, the 95% confidence intervals are compatible with a 46% reduction to a 23% increase in infection. I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to interject something called publisher bias. And publisher bias would be me trying to mold uh, the opinion or the or influence the audience in a way that is, in my view, and not necessarily clean, clean, clear-cut data in a Boolean sense. To keep on going. Do, do, do. So we're going to revisit the Demas study just because, again. There are a lot of great studies in reference to the benefits and the negatives in reference to masks. And, you know, the Dan Mask study really referenced possibly people touching their faces continuously. Remember that in the beginning of the whole pandemic? Part of the reason they didn't want to do masks because people were touching the face, their eyes, the nose. Not that the masks didn't work in an isolated setting. You can't really get past that. But however, though, what these researchers want to do is look at it in a real world setting. And people touch their face, touch things, and touch that. Uh, the hypothesis the research results came to is people are less likely to clean their hands when wearing, ironically, a mask. And therefore, uh, with fomites, uh, preventing the provided that the SARS-CoV-2 is actually transmissible from a surface, they touch the surface and they touch their face and end story. But here we go. In this community-based randomized controlled trial conducted in a setting where mask wearing was uncommon and was not among the recommended public health measures related to COVID-19, a recommendation to wear a surgical mask when outside the home, among others, did not reduce at convention levels of statistical significance incident to SARS-CoV-2 infection compared with no mask recommendation. Quoting, we designed the study to detect a reduction in infection rate from 2% to 1%. Oh, that's, that's pretty darn good. Although no statistically significant differences in SARS-CoV-2 incidents was observed, the 95% confidence interval, not for those not familiar with confidence intervals, it means you know 95% of the of the results would end within a certain um, range. Uh, compatible with possible to a 46% reduction to 23% increase in infection among mass words. Yeah, you are. We are reading that right, and that's not fake news. And we're not saying the research is fake news, but in order for this to be attacked, you really have to attack the research and not attack the people, if provided they're not bots, transmitting the research or communicating it. All right, you get where I'm going with that. And to proceed, do do do. We observed no statistical significance, even with people wearing glasses. They checked that out too. Remember, we went to two masks, three masks, four masks. People were actually advertising space helmets on TV for a while. But here it is. Recent reports indicate that transmission of SARS-CoV-2 via fomites is unusual, but masks may alter behavior and potentially affect fomite transmission. 
That's all that we're trying to say. It's, I mean, obviously, masks are going to, they're going to stop saliva above five microns per se uh, as much. Not going to stop it. They're going to reduce its transmission. And the hypothesis at the time with masks is you can reduce the viral load exposure. Eventually, you could develop a potentially some sort of a natural resistance to whatever it comes down to be. That was the hypothesis. And fact checkers, keep that in mind if you're listening to this, which is probably 10% of my audience. Uh, for a of, what are we, like 70 people watch these videos per week. But however, though, again, reiterate, May, we're analyzing the study of a study. And there it is. The damn mass study is a real study, although be it may be used unintendedly. All right, to proceed as follows. Now, we're going to go over here real fast. We're going to go back just a little bit, and this is going to throw our fact checkers for a loop. Right here we go. This is part of the reason why it went to Outbreak Info. And because we're looking for correlations potentially to why these mutations. And I'm a real big proponent of viral pathogen replacement. Does that mean I promote viral pathogen replacement? I am uh, I am aligned with somewhat some bias, a reference to basically viral pathogen replacement. That's what drew me. That's what drew me there. But I'm going to read this one paragraph from you, verbatim. I am not going to add anything to it. And you draw your own conclusion. And the link will be there for you to follow as well. This research came out recently, and it is called Evidence of Escape of SARS-CoV-2 Variant B1351 from Natural and Vaccine-Induced Serum. Here we go. So we're going to look, basically read through the article right here. And the one paragraph that caught my attention was this. And I'm going to read it to you very slowly. Here we examine the neutralization of B1351 viral isolate and compare this to the neutralization of Victoria, da, 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 an early Wuhan related virus neutralization. Assays are performed in a large panel of MABS. Convalescent serum from early in the pandemic, here we go. Serum from patients, Sarah, from patients suffering from B117 and finally Sarah from recipients of the Oxford, AstraZeneca and Pfizer tech vaccines. Ah, uh, know what? That's the wrong one. So let me find it for you. Ready? Here it goes. Da, 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 da. Please forgive the uh, the misstep there. Here we go. But it'll only take a second for us to find. Here we are. Da 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 all right, here we go. This is where it goes. Ready? In vitro evolution experiments have recently reported in which live virus has been induced. I'm going to read verbatim. Now, I can even add does and ands or anything else like that. Live virus has been induced to evolve in the face of immune pressure from either MABS or polyclonal uh, serum. Interestingly, repeated use of plasma therapy in an immunocompromised individual led to the transient emergence of the N501Y mutation, as well as a 69-70 deletion in the NTD, which is characteristic of B117. Furthermore, serial passage of the virus in subneutralizing concentration of immune plasma led to the emergence of the deletion of F140 and the creation of a new N-linked glycos glycosation sequ sequon in the NTD together with the E48K RBD mu mutation. I'll read through it once again. Because this is important because, let's say, for example, a vaccine is not as strong as is intended uh, or other. Or other. It, you have to look at the potential that certain treatments may accelerate uh, certain non-favorable events. All right, did I word that appropriately? Now I'm going to read it one more time. Interestingly, repeated use of plasma therapy in an immune-compromised individual led to the transient emergence of the N501 mutation, as well as the 69-7 deletion in the NTD, which is characteristic of B117. I will have that link there for you as well. 
All right, but let's proceed to the next article as follows. And da, da, da. this one came down to mRNA technology pioneer says COVID-19 vaccinated people can shed spike protein. Twitter says delete this. In reviewing the article, now it's what we are doing. I think Luigi Warren tweeted that people vaccinated with mRNA-based vaccine can shed spike proteins reading the article. He added that shedding is in a minuscule amount and hence cannot harm anyone. But just because this individual, and who is this individual, you may ask, and Twitter then suspended his account for violating Twitter rules. Who is this individual? This individual is, let's go back past the ads, read more, da 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 Back in 2010, Luigi and Derek worked together to be the first to describe mRNA-based reprogramming in a path-breaking paper in Cell Stem Cell titled Highly Efficient Reprogramming to Pluripotency and Directed Differentiation of Human Cells with Synthetic Modified mRNA. The work was named as one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of 2010 by the Journal of Science as well as the top 10 medical breakthroughs of the year by Time Magazine. So you see the... Uh, the conundrum, where you could have actually the main researchers in reference to the field of science, which you are basically injecting people with, uh, per se, uh, basically, uh, basically removed from the debate altogether, because his uh, basically how would you word it in such a way that it's not harmonious to popular biases and which brings in the word called anchor bias and that's a word I tend to use right here is when you meet resistance with something you tend to form an anchor bias so if you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine and you whatever it is you develop an anchor bias where you basically you're biased by one person's view on a particular subject or if you're a doctor uh, basically um, diagnosing an individual Anchor bias can be real common when you start just locking into one particular symptom for everything. So anchor bias, and that's what comes to these uh, interesting individuals. So here's an, is an individual where Twitter said, I don't know if they, they censored it because of misinformation or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. They said that it was misinformation. So the guy's, if, if his credentials aren't good enough for uh, to basically help uh, contribute to the debate, then, then pfft. Maybe Twitter is, I don't know. Twitter, it's up to you. I like Twitter. I'm saying, don't get mad at me, Twitter. I'm just reading your article. You are the ones that deleted it, not I. Next, Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. This plays in a role right here with what we read earlier in reference to the plasma therapy, which was right here. So that's what that kind of runs into. But this is innovative at the same time, too, a little disconcerting. Uh, now, again, I'm not an expert on this, and these are the experts. So, but still, at the same time, too, it, it gives them an opportunity, for example, for them to explain what to do in reference to the safety of whatever it comes down to be. Now, what we're looking at right here is this. There are two reasons researchers chose HIV to create their chimeric viruses. So what are they doing? They're developing viruses so they can test the vaccine because it's easier that way. So what they said basically here, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is important because the only structure in the virus who exposed to the outside, the spike protein is what sticks out from the virus. And so this is what they did. There are two reasons the researchers chose HIV to create the chimeric viruses. First, HIV is not particularly about incorporating the HIV spike protein. It will take most any virus spike protein. Second, the HIV virus has been engineered to carry two reported genes that allow the researchers to study the virus entry. Antibody biting, biting, biting. No, I'm not talking about the president. Antibody binding and antibody neutralization. When the virus infects a cell, the cell turns green and produces luciferophase. I know, don't get conspiratorial. Luciferophase, luciferophase. The enzyme that makes the fireflies light up at night. This provides a quick and easy way to count how many cells have been infected. The spike protein pseudotyped. Lentiviruses are extremely useful experimental tools. They were developed in the course of HIV research. Now, this is where the conspiracy goes through. They're using HIV, for example, to engineer viruses to test the vaccine. And, of course, we all know a certain individual whose primary research was in reference to HIV. 
They are less biohazardous and easier to work with in the lab. Again, beautiful, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful science. It, I just love science as far as the research and innovation and everything else like that. But I don't have to say anything for it to, to draw your own questions, not conclusions, questions. And next one we go, this is important because I just want to cover these so people understand the fast that we can end this pandemic one way or the other, or at least the mitigation, especially here in California, the better. Children cannot understand sadness and happiness in people wearing face masks. The collateral effect of the preventive measures linked to the COVID-19 health emergency could influence the correct development of child, children's capabilities of social interaction in the frontiers of psychology. I'll have the link there for you to go into it on your own. Next one we want to go to is this. And this is common too because this is, I think, is propagating a lot of the fear in reference to the pandemic as well as continuing polarization between people. There are some people that appear do not want, they became so accustomed uh, to the pandemic that it almost appears they don't want the pandemic to end for whatever reason, either out of extreme caution, fear, uh, but I have to and will respect their perception. Although their perception doesn't have to be my perception. But this is kind of what's happened. The term doom scrolling describes the act of endlessly scrolling through bad news. A habit that unfortunately seems to become common during the COVID-19 pandemic. And once you start doom scrolling, what ends up happening? The algorithms and everything else there in your favorite news sources, whatever it is, uh, pick up your behavior. And by picking up your behavior, they create this little echo chamber. Know who's really good about that? T-R-T-R. -T -R, T -W -I -T -T -E -R. And so my other favorite news source, TikTok. Once you go, for example, like in one source of likes or whatever it is or whatever methodology, then all you're being fed is the exact same thing until the point you think everyone thinks exactly like you do, which is cool, I guess. All right, next, let's go right into the data analytics as possible, but still just the same. I'll have the link for you, but I like this article, even though it may not have anything to do with improving anybody's physical health or well-being, but maybe it does. We'll see. I hope it does. Let us proceed as follows into the data analyst as type. Ba, ba, ba. All right, we're going to start right here. Da, da, do. I want to make this the world data. Well, first, before I go, I want to run the um, our uh, our, doo -doo -doo, our Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Doo -doo -doo. Actually, this is what I do for the um, stock investments. All right, so let's go into the COVID world data. I'm going to make this screen a little bit bigger real fast because it's just yeah, obviously easier for people to read. Uh, doo -doo -doo, and it's not getting bigger. Who cares? All right, well, we're going to do what we got here. Right here we go. All right, world data to start off with. I'm not going to go through all the data as much because I want to look primarily at Asia and primary reason why is because we are on our way out and I said this last June too but at that time uh, things began to increase pretty dramatically because what did we happen we started testing people that weren't normally tested uh, asymptomatic and that created the um, the pandemic type event there we go there's 110 there's perfect all right world vaccine to mortality percentage Oh, this just happens to add on this. All right, now check this out. Now, correlation is not causation. And keep in mind, there are less cases. So since there's less cases, you're probably going to have individuals who are more vulnerable. Now, that can lead to conflation, confounding, bias, whatever it is. But check this out. Ready? Here it is. And I'm going to say this ahead of time, just to disarm it. Fully vaccinated people per 100. That is your purple line right there. You see? Purple line. Now, what you're noticing is that they tend to follow the same slope. And we're going to look at a lot of correlations that tend to be right along the line. So this is the new deaths, new cases. Basically, it's the mortality percentage. Let's get me out of the way. There it is, mortality percentage. So the mortality percentage in the vaccines can look pretty solidly correlated. But however, though, keep in mind, the people which are probably getting COVID or succumbing to COVID, I should say, respectfully, uh, are probably people which are more vulnerable, immunocompromised. And so, yeah, you're going to have less people get COVID, but you may have a higher mortality percentage among those people. You see what I mean? All right, there we go. Let's go down the line here. Do, 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 do. Make sure. Check this out, too. 
New deaths and new cases. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pattern searcher. I love patterns. Not, I love finding patterns. All right, but here it is. Check this out. Uh, new deaths to new cases. There's mortality percentage again. All right, so red your mortality percentage. Look at that. And purple is your new cases per million. That's freaky. But hof now hopefully this stays down here. But you see the, the aspect there? Again, the confounding involved in this could be very simple, that the people which are most vulnerable are getting ill, so you have less cases. Therefore, you have a higher mortality because the people left over getting sick are immunocompromised. So that's probably a natural occurrence in reference to being less cases, but the people who do have it are pretty bad off. You see what I mean? All right, but let's go back to the world data real fast. Do, 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 Look at it just drop like a rock. Deaths did increase a little bit towards the end. Asia dropped. Asia dropped. And give me one second. You know, after this, I'm going to go straight to the vaccine data for those which are short on time. Ready? Drop. And then do, 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 do. Let's just go down here and let's and here's your Europe case of mortality, so on and so forth. Please forgive me for being short in reference to that. But let's go back into the VARES data. Because, I, I, again, for those concerned with most that are short on time. All right, this is what we're doing. Again, for those fact checkers out there, we are basically breaking up the, uh, we're actually not breaking up, we're merging databases. We are merging all the databases as up to a part. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, symptoms, some diversions. We are measuring dates of vaccinations. We are merging the vaccine types and the lot numbers. It'll be real important. Here we go. All right, and some individuals again uh, will have experienced. These are all your duplicates, just for those that are looking for them. All right, and there's your vaccine types. We'll bring it down. Uh, and here we go. Vaccine reaction reports by vaccine. Moderna. If we look at the numbers here, they have here, Moderna, 149,077. There it is graph-wise. Uh, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, uh, doo -doo -doo. just notice the way it's spelt there. We're looking at 127,058. Janssen, again, this is not to give a percentage. You have much higher, to be fair, I should do it in a way as percentage of uh, you know, as far as the vaccine, as opposed to just being numerical. It doesn't give a fair light. Uh, Janssen, 38,361. Now, as a test case, let's put it this way. We have only have one vaccine-averse event report for measles, mumps, rubella. One to polio. One to influenza. One to menococcal conjugate, uh, menotorex, but you get an idea right there. That's how it compares to all the other vaccines that are currently being administered. And that is a freaking heck of a lot of vaccines. And so vaccine reports at 316,925 since the beginning of January to June 11th. Let's proceed forward. COVID, COVID, COVID vaccine reaction reports by age. Remember, these are real. Zero to five are real real vaccine reactions. Usually they're in reference to mothers who are breastfeeding, who have become vaccinated the next day and the infants encounter problems via V breastfeeding. So you understand what I mean. All right, and this is by age. Yeah, there's some really old people that unfortunately have reactions to the vaccine. But if you look here, you have a bell curve, which is pretty similar to general population. Deaths. Not increasing as fast as the vaccine reactions as is, but these are, again, these are vaccine event reports. They have to be validated. And on that, I have to basically side with the fact checkers. Until it's validated, it's not confirmed. But in the same light, people that are saying the vaccine is perfectly safe need to basically mold their hypothesis based upon data, not upon what is it called? an anchor bias. Data. Can the data that we're presenting here from the CDC, or the CDC is actually presenting to us, can the data that we have here give a person saying the vaccine is safe? Or 
or is it worded in a way which say the risk to benefit ratio is justified? That's how it has to be worded. If people that speak in absolutes, I'm about to speak in absolute, that's adding publisher bias. Real scientists, there I go again. People who may be scientists rarely speak in absolutes because, again, they leave themselves open to learn and form new opinions based upon the relevant data. Here it is, and yes, that remember that one right there? That was a, a very, very unfortunate event of a infant at five months uh, succumbing to potentially, potentially a vaccine reaction when the mother had been vaccinated and then breastfed the next day. And it was, it's, a, it's a sad story, and I, wanna, I don't want to read it again. I mean, honestly, you can go there on your own and find the information yourself in the CDC uh, database. Uh, it's easy to do. But a lot of these are heartbreaking. I don't know if it's related to the, the vaccines a cause. Uh, but how are those just the same? It's their sad period. All right. Vaccine relates by day of the week. Uh, as you can tell, because these days proceed. COVID, COVID, COVID vaccine, react, vaccine reaction reports by the week. Again, that's seven day rolling. All right. Now you get the data more easily to understand. We just covered that in the very beginning. Ah, do, 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 going down, down, down here. Uh, now, this is actually interesting. Uh, let's go. Actually, I take that back. It's not interesting. It's, it's actually sad. Uh, these are the individuals under the age of 22. And the reason I picked uh, the younger age is because the health integrity tends to be higher. Um, and so these are individuals that had died and then had the vaccine event report occur. Um, and you could see the vaccines, you could see basically down this way. Let's go to the bottom there so we can slide it because the screw a little bit. Uh, the reasons uh, that may have been, you know, this right here, the suicides, I, it needs to be investigated. Now, many people remember in 1998, uh, the rubella vaccine was used in a few studies because it, it created an inflammation, and inflammation was related to something else. Uh, I'm not going to go into it right now, but I will cover the 1998 study uh, and what they did in reference to utilizing that vaccine for certain reasons. Uh, but however, though, vaccines have been shown to affect mood. And the question is, this needs to be investigated to see whether this is a relation or not. Uh, yeah, you have a lot of this. This is this and this are real common. Uh, you see right there, as far as the people that unfortunately, the young individuals were succumb, it's either one or the other. It's either, it's either cardiac arrest or, or suicide. All right, let's go down to the da data here once again. Uh, these are a lot of just a test of the reactions. Um, again, it, these are real lives, and I do have a hard time because as you begin to read these stories, and that's why I think your media elements are not going to read any of the stories because they are heartbreaking. All right, this is all ages. Let's back this up a little bit. This is basically a word cloud, just a very easy way of getting an idea of um, the most common ailments that most individuals that are basically experiencing uh, either validated or what, or correlated. That's all L ages. And here are the top 30 reported symptoms. I'll give you a second to read down the line there. Now, obviously headache is number one. So a lot of these are superfluous, meaning they're very, very minor. Uh, but as time goes on and you start getting, you know, uh, down to like, you're talking 5,000 reports of like or close to 4,000, uh, you know, as you go down the line of reading some of these these reactions here. Um, and now keep in mind too, the average length of time from vaccination to the report being made is 20 days. Now there's also an, uh, an interesting effect too, which is showing some patterns, six weeks. When we do a, a string search, for those not familiar, we're looking basically like a you know, A, B, C, or whatever it is, uh, letters. Uh, six weeks comes up a lot, at least over 1,500 times. So the really 
not so great reports where the, the reactions are stronger appear to be at the six week period of time as opposed to 20 day delay time. And we're going to probably create a Kaplan Meyer survival function uh, in the coming weeks in reference to that. All right, here's our word search COVID reaction reports by age and minors. You see right there? And this area is beginning to grow over last week, uh, day and week in minors. And again, this is just to find patterns. Uh, now, this I, I I put this in the middle, so please forgive me on this. This is kind of out of out of uh, out of the um, out of form, or I should say, out of sequence. All right, so let's back this up just a little bit. What this is here. Now, again, I like I like I like to search for patterns. And here we are. What we're looking at is lot numbers to reports. What lot numbers are yielding the greatest number of adverse event reports? And again, this really has to do in the percentage of the, how large the lot was. For example, this was like millions of vaccines, you know, 100 and, you know, 57 or whatever it is, or 155 uh, is not going to be a lot. So, but however, though, if you start seeing something like this begin to rise, and let's say it's not a lot out of that lot, then there could be issues. Not necessarily with the vaccine, it could be with storage, it could be with administration, it could be a lot of different reasons. But I'm starting to keep track of the lot numbers and emerging the database as well. All right, proceed forward. Um, now look at this one here. This is the reactions. This is just the tail 15. Now the tail 15, for those not familiar, it means it's the last 15 of a data set. And the data set, for example, here is June 4, 2021. And what you notice a lot of here are the reports. Now keep this in mind too. Uh, basically, people are falsifying the ages of the children in order to get a vaccine. And you'll find a lot of time uh, right here, you see the age requirements. And this is just on the tail end. This happens to be purely coincidental. And these are the ages. Uh, and obviously the one that most likely is going to be, be an administer to children for whatever reason. Again, we went through this last week or the week before. It's still the Janssen vaccine. So they got to get their act together. They're administering a vaccine to individuals which are below the age that's supposed to be. Uh, no fault of the manufacturer, but fault of the administrators. And, you know, it's pretty common. And it appears that the medical individuals who are administering the vaccine are reporting it ahead of time just to cover themselves, even though there may not be any symptoms. Actually, I take that back. There is some symptoms. Deafness, peripheral swelling, um, you know, you know, basically they check their loss of consciousness, da, da, da. You know, just basically inappropriate age. They're covering themselves. So that's part of your vaccine event, adverse event reports as well. But still, people are lying about their age, you know, to get vaccinated. I don't know if that was the intended consequence or not in reference to the vaccine promotion campaigns. All right, let's go into a data frame as follows. This is in children. This is what children feel most often, as we covered before. And, yeah, there is reason for concern or should I say, is there not reason for concern? If basically children are reporting these symptoms, yeah, it could be a form of mass hysteria uh, propagated by media, but still just the same. You know, is it worthy to look at? Is Should I be discounting it or should we be discounting it all because of vaccine advocacy? Again, I just reported, I'm not gonna say yes or no. And here is the top 30 reported symptoms of minors. Let me back this up just a little bit and see if we can get there one more time. All right, so this is the top 30. Actually, one more time. Please forgive me. And where did we go here? Not oh, bounce down. All right, this is the top 30 reported symptoms of minors. Headache, dizziness, fatigue, hydrosis, hydrosis. And you get some real interesting, I should say, uh, you know, perspective. A reference to basically C-reactive protein increasing, not as large number of uh, negative uh, adverse event reports as the adults section. But then again, too, uh, we just started vaccinating children and the average length between vaccine report 
and do I have it here? The vaccine report and um, you know vaccination and report was twenty days. Let's see, if we go down here. Let's see right here. Vaccine reports and vaccines administered. I remember I did the hypothesis. I wanted to see if there was going to be a higher number of reports as time goes on. But here we look, we're closing a gap here. So this is the blue is the daily vaccines. All right. And we're looking towards June. And then this is the vaccine reports. So, you know, it's interesting as far as noticing those patterns. Uh, but that's the reports. And then let's get something a little easier to understand. Average age of adverse reactions by report. There's the average ages. That's we're just grouping all the ages together and not doing the mode most common age. We're just averaging. So, a hundred year old with a you know a zero, you know would be fifty. You know what I mean? So it's very very basic math. Nothing fancy in regression, linear regressions, or anything like that. All right. Now this is the six weeks. Now this is interesting because the six week pattern we're noticing quite a bit, and I want to make this a little bigger so it's easy to read. The reactions, what we're doing here is looking for strings that contain six weeks. And again, you know, we're having a mix of vaccines here. Uh, we're, I'm looking for commonality. For example, you may see Flonase uh, or certain medications which are taken with the vaccines, a lot of multivitamins, prenatals, and you know, whether they have breathing problems to begin with. And some of the reactions that are occurring at six weeks um, if you look at them, are, you know, are, you know, not, not, I mean, they're pretty heavy duty. And so it's, that six week, uh, if you look at it as survival function, and if a person, for example, at least in short term effect, doesn't seem to have any serious reactions after six weeks, then maybe you go to the next phase, long-term uh, side effects, because they'll have no opportunity to study those in the phase three trial. Remember, vaccines usually take 12 to 15 years. I mean, they take a lot of work. That's why a lot of companies didn't want to do it. So, you, you, yeah, you may have made an accomplishment, but been working off of old data and come up with a vaccine. But still, you don't know the long-term effects as of yet. And so I can't, I can't say if it's hazardous or safe. No one really can. It's just conjecture. That's why I don't like when people speak in absolute saying, well, it's, you know, it's this way. No, maybe if the risk to benefit ratio is acceptable. All right. Now I want to go right here and I'll probably have to cut it short after this because it's getting pretty late if you look at that right there. All right. What we're doing here, remember, we're going to um, do, 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 outbreakinfo.com. Remember right here. Beautiful, beautiful website. Again, for the media individuals out there or, or basically biostatisticians or data analysts, uh, really, really great website uh, for basically looking for data. But that's what we utilize right there. And so what we want to do is looking at the data. So we want I want to take their variants, mutations, strains, whatever you want to call it, and break it down to see the growth beyond what their chart had showed. So I want to extend the data out there. And I want you to look at this. Check this out. This goes back to... Uh, you know, now I'm not saying conspiracy theory, I'm just saying correlation. Blue is your basically your vaccine. And this goes to the end date, so there's some not a number for the data analysts out there, so this is what we're going to clean up in a second. Here is red. Red is your B117 variant. I'm not going to say anything because those who know already know where I'm going with this. All right, here we go. Now we cut the last four days off, so we have a cleaner graph here. Green is your other. Remember, they just had other out there because I guess it was accumulation of variants, which they didn't have really any designation for. Red, again, is your B117. Blue is your vaccines. Isn't that freaking amazing, the correlation there? Now, again, if you run the numbers enough, eventually you can make anything correlate. But this is very basic, just going by the numbers uh, generally between new vaccinations, smooth per million, and the growth in the variants from the, even they said this, they have selection bias as well, because you have to look for the test of the variants. And so the outbreak info is very, very honest about that. 
And I think Outbreak Info rents their data from John Hopkins and other sources. I uh, don't want to discredit anybody by not mentioning them for credit. But really, really good. But there it is right there. Now, the correlation. Vaccine. New fact. Just correlation. Again, there could be other con- con- correlation. Even if it's a seven point, a 70% correlation does not mean it's causal. But, however, though, still just the same. It's curious. Now, the other, for example, 71.9% going down. So the vaccine definitely had an impact potential. No, so they definitely had a correlation with the other going down. And if you believe it, the viral pathogen replacement, which I tend to be a very strong proponent of, the idea, interesting. Interesting, because it's just so linear. Not like a scatter plot or whatever it is, just like interesting. All right, here is our heat map. We will let a very, very basic model uh, in reference to what correlates with what. B117.69. This new vaccinations per mil. Oh, I got the date ordinal on there. Well, let's let's forget about that. Uh, B117 to, let's say, B1526. B117 to B1526.1. So you see possibly how it works out where one can ebb and flow. One becomes less dominant. Think of it like seats on a bus. You have 50 seats on a bus, but you always have 50 seats. So when you look at something, when you look at a chart, like for example, like this, you see one. One means 100%. It doesn't mean like you, one, you have, you have 10,000 people infected or 100,000 or, or 10. And this just gives you a percentage of that group of that particular uh, vaccine variant. I mean, that vaccine variant, take that back, variant, there it is. So basically, that's what we're looking at as far as a, a very simplistic heat map. And I'll leave that because you can tell right off the bat, you see anything like that, it's, it's real interesting, 0. 0.94, 1526 is 0. 0.94 correlated with new vaccinations per million. So let's say, for example, something does go awry. This is a very, very, very rudimentary way of saying, hey, let's look into this. And don't have to bother with that. That's me looking for things like this because I'm curious about things like that. And you see these straight lines. You're going, where's that straight line with? And yes, yeah, so that's so you have like 0.1562 is somehow potentially correlated with 1.5621. All right, for the layman, let's move on. And so here we are. There's your variance. And for example, if you look here, it, the color may not come out well to the dark background. You see that there? And then you see basically, I'm going to take that there, like, you know what I'm talking about. That's like that there. There's B117, and there is other. And then I'm just, you can see where I'm leading with this. I'm trying to explore fitted values, residuals. I'm not going to go into what I'm trying to explore, but I think uh, without wording it in a way which is um, not conducive to the video not being pulled, but reference to that, that's what I'm looking at. All right, and then da 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 da. All right, what do we have here? There's not really that much. Let's look at, uh, you know, here. Let's go back to fin- let's see right here. Is India? Uh, the mortality rates, thank goodness, are going down. Look how fast the pandemic is being to collapse in India. Uh, even though testing is going up, cases are dropping dramatically. Uh, other countries, the same thing. There's re- somehow what I have been doing has been traveling from going more to monitoring the pandemic into more so monitoring the inoculation trend. I didn't want it to take that route, but that's the route we've been heading. But yeah, other places they experience the same uh, algorithm appears other places have. Um, there's, you know, the other, Jason. there's your distribution of vaccines per se. And if everyone is fully vaccinated in each state, I don't know. I, Alaska close to ninety percent. If the, everything was perfect, you need to, that's like that, that's like not even that's like every vial being delivered to Alaska is being injected in someone's arm. New York, is that real? Thirty four point seven two percent. Are they like in like behind everyone uh, in vaccination? I'm not a proponent of the vaccination. I'm just saying. Well, logistically, this seems to be a, uh, an issue. I'd say it seems to be a fail, but it's an issue. But there you are, vaccine delivery was perfect by June 12, 21. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I don't think there's anything else really to cover tonight. 
Um, hospital occupancy is like freaking way down. Uh, all the charts built up. Uh, mortality is way down. Again, this is something we went through back in June of last year. Hopefully it stays this time. And um, But otherwise, outside of that, we'll just leave it at that. Let's cover the stories real fast and all the links. Do, do, do. Wonderful site. Beautiful site. Go here. Great stuff. Great, great, great um, uh, infotainment site, so to say. As opposed to news, this is actually cool stuff. All right, once you get to understand it, it's it it's to understand is to empower. Better for you to know and learn and be able to ask the right questions, as opposed to just basically trusting a uh, a bureaucratic establishment based upon uh, its Machiavellian pretense in reference to its alluded form of governance over Stockholm syndrome. Meaning, oh, if you do exactly what I say, I will basically reinstate your inalienable freedoms. If you do exactly what I say, then you're happy about that. When in reality, you should be going, what the heck? I used to have freedom of speech and freedom to walk and freedom to travel and freedom to do this and that. When, and you're saying, what? Hmm. All right, proceed forward. That's publisher bias. Here we go. First one, this one right here, and I'll cover the links for that. Again, it gives food for thought, um, especially. Uh, various data sets, which is our information database, which I want to show with the fact checkers. Uh, Really cool, once again, uh, the bots. Uh, we're going to relink the Denmas study just so basically people don't accidentally think it's uh, it doesn't get buried into the collateral damage of fake news or whatever it, it is because it's not really fake. Uh, India Today, why do they have news that we don't? Huh? All right. Uh, so think about that. Uh, to do, do vaccine protective effects against that interesting way of engineering things and it's it's just intriguing you know how this can go awry but yet at the same time too you know that can be very helpful everything like that's a double-edged sword it's like nuclear power uh mass thing you, you know all the data I'm, i've seen i'm not a big fan of the data in reference to the justification of masks because the data when they do justify it tends to be in lab settings uh, as opposed to that and sometimes their studies are surveys and not actually studies uh the brain areas as far as doom scrolling and i'm guilty of that myself but otherwise again gratitude thank you look forward to see you all once again next week and we'll start winding a lot of this down but however though if you like i'll keep it going for a little while longer and uh, in, if not, we could just basically uh, meld it into something different as far as all of the research articles, which I can't really report on, on our regular clinical news reports every Tuesday, which I've always wanted to do, like um, population becoming more diverse as time goes on, the actual ages of people during the Middle Ages that uh, basically alludes to uh, some sort of a bias that we tend to have. There's lots and lots of cool stuff. What happens when you inject uh, the cold virus into the muscle, uh, how it basically uh, it mimics some other types of ailments, which I don't want to specify right now. And we can cover that, you know, later on too as well. But otherwise, outside of that, gratitude. Thank you again. I'm an amateur data person. So if I make mistakes, please bring them forward and I will learn from your advice. Catch you all next time. Humbly, see you later. And thank you to all the researchers. Whether I'm a fan of the research, that's a fan, I'm a fan of all research. Whether I necessarily understand the desired outcome of the research or not in reference to their perspective, I always, regardless, appreciate the research. Catch you all next time. See you then. Bye.